Welcome to Chat with the Lawyer. I'm your host, Walla Blagay, and today we are honored to have a celebrity in the house, Delegate Eric Barron from the 24th Legislative District. Delegate Barron is also a criminal law attorney who has been working in criminal law, former prosecutor, many other positions in criminal law for years, and we're going to hear some very interesting information today, including about the 2016 legislative session, things that we should know, and also about important things in criminal law, including his very interesting career, even working on a death penalty case. So this is going to be an exciting day. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Appreciate being here. All right. So tell us about your career. How did you get into criminal law and also how did you become a delegate? Well, um, I guess it starts way back. Uh, my, my mother and I, we had some help from a legal aid attorney wow. back when I was knee high. Um, <laughs> You know, and from that point on, in the back of my mind, I said, you know, lawyers help people, and I want to be a part of helping people. So I um, went to University of Maryland College Park, went to George Washington University for law school. Uh, I came out and uh, was uh, an assistant state's attorney here in Prince George's County. I was also a prosecutor in Baltimore City. Wow. I practiced as a federal prosecutor. Uh, worked on the Hill for Senator Biden and then worked on the Obama transition team. Um, and from that, uh, went out and private practice on my own, uh, practicing criminal defense. And now I'm with uh, a uh, larger firm, Whiteford Taylor and Preston, based out of Baltimore. Oh, impressive. Thank you. All right. Well, let's go into the 2016 legislative session. Now, we know some of the other session had some big milestones, um, and we do know that this session actually dealt with a lot of criminal justice issues, right? Right, right. So, so let's talk about some of those criminal justice issues that were discussed during session. Well, w one of the bills that we passed, I uh, had the pleasure of being at the center of, of, of writing it and, and and uh, uh, shepherding it through the General Assembly. And uh, it was a bipartisan effort. This bill is called the Justice uh, Reinvestment Act. And this was really a, uh, uh, a, this is a landmark piece of legislation, probably the biggest reform, criminal justice reform bill in Maryland's history. Uh, changing how we do corrections and changing a number of, of uh, uh, aspects dealing with sentencing, especially with nonviolent drug offenses. Um, and just to give you kind of a summary of what the bill does, uh, it, it again, it focuses on nonviolent drug offenses. We found that almost 60% of our incarcerated prison population is there for drug offenses. Mm -hmm. And most of the, most of the people, most of these individuals are those who have substance abuse problems. Mm -hmm. Um, and we found out that uh, we're not treating individuals for the, their substance abuse problems. Uh, it takes an average of 167 days to get a treatment bed if you're found guilty and you're, you're incarcerated on a drug offense and you have a substance abuse problem. Um, so that, those numbers are unacceptable um, and if we're really going to make strides in terms of reducing crime rates, reducing costs on corrections, um, then we have to make some changes in sentencing and we have to invest in uh, drug treatment. So now, after this bill is passed, has passed and bill's been signed by the governor, uh, you got to get a treatment bed within 21 days or else the health department has to come to court and explain to the judge why they, that person's not in the treatment bed. Um, everybody who is sentenced um, on a f an offense is going to get a risk and needs assessment. Mm -hmm. And so then we're going to have a roadmap to what an individual needs to do and the programming they need in order to be successfully rehabilitated by the time uh, they're ready to transition in the community. Uh, we, we know these individuals are going to come back to the community. We might as well do what we can to make sure that they, uh, they're on the right track when they come out. That's absolutely what the bill does. And do you feel, because a lot of people, um, I've, I've always said that um, a lot of drug offenders are African American. Like there's been a targeting of African American as like a, a way to just sort of crowd black men in jail. Do you feel this way or? Well, I, I'll put it this way. Um, this, this particular bill was part of a year long 
effort, um, and I was on a, a bipartisan council that really took a deep dive in the evidence on what our system looks like, what are the drivers of our incarcerated population. And the numbers don't lie. What we found is that at least 70% of our incarcerated prison population essentially looks like me. They're black men. Um, and I'm, as you probably know, black men, we're probably not even 14 to 15% of the Maryland population, but we're 70 plus percent of the prison population. So clearly there's a disparity there, a drastic disparity. Um, and what the numbers show is uh, it's an unwarranted and unjustified disparity. And what, we, what we're hoping to do is move towards uh, a fairer system, a model that is you know, closer to a public health model, um, and that you know we're doing things that that aren't uh, don't have a desperate impact on communities of color. Right now, did you find because you're sort of trying to move people off of drugs by going going into the treatment center? So did you find that there was a lot of people going right back into the criminal justice system that were drug offenses? Is this why you started to look into that? Absolutely. Um, so you know when. It, it, you, have, you have a captured audience, essentially, when you have somebody who, for whatever reason, has committed an offense and is in the criminal justice system. Um, if we're serious about reducing crime, if we're serious about getting, the peop getting people the help, help they need to the extent they have health care problems, um, then we need to take advantage of that captured audience and get them the treatment they need. What we, what we were doing was we were saying that we care about getting people help, but in effect, people were rotating through the system, and before they would have an opportunity to get some either some behavioral mental health treatment or drug treatment, they were already back on the streets. So what's gonna happen? They're gonna rotate right back in. Um, so this is going to drastically reduce that and you know what, frankly, there's, a, there's a, a strong fiscal component to all this. It costs a lot more money to incarcerate someone right. than to get them the treatment that they need, the help they need to be a good citizen. Right, right. And they also say, I mean, I don't know if there's real numbers behind this, but America locks more people up in jail than any other first world country, really. Than any other country, by far. Uh, and that includes, you know, countries that we'd be really surprised about, wow. you know, Russia, China. Wow. We incarcerate more than everyone. Um, so, you know, this is... It, this, is, this has become a bipartisan effort because uh, at the end of the day, budgets are tight and people are looking at the money and they're saying, you know right. what, uh, in Maryland it costs somewhere between uh, $37,000 and $40,000 a year to incarcerate an individual uh, as opposed to just a fraction of that money when, it, when we're talking about uh, someone who has uh, behavioral health, mental health issues, or substance abuse issues costs a fraction of that money to treat them, to right. get them the help they need, and the programmatic um, uh, uh, things that will get them back on the right foot, right. Uh, than incarcerating them. Right. Mm -hmm. So what else did, were you able to do with um, some of the bills? I know criminal justice was a huge issue. There was a big issue on police accountability. Right. People cried that police have unfettered power and being able to um, to sort of go through the process regardless of what they do without right. any consequences. Right. Um, so there was a, another piece of, a separate piece of legislation that dealt uh, with the issue of police accountability. Um, as, as you're aware, uh, this kind of was largely born out of the Freddie Gray uprising in Baltimore. Um, and the acknowledgement that we really need to do something to uh, connect the community with law enforcement and ensure that the few uh, bad apples that may be out there or those individuals who just don't, don't have proper training uh, get the training they need and that we get the accountability that we need from those who are uh, in law enforcement but may not be doing the right thing. So this bill uh, attempts to take steps to, to repair that uh, relationship with the community uh, in terms of training 
and uh, in terms of some structural changes in how we deal with uh, police brutality issues and, and police officers who, who may do the wrong thing on, on the streets. Um, can you, do you know some of the structural changes in the bill? So we're going to take a look at, there's what say, uh, there are uh, uh, boards when an officer, right. civilian, in, in, boards. civilian boards and internal boards that review uh, cases of, you know, police misconduct. Um, so we're going to look at possibility of uh, ci citizen, more citizen participation in those boards. Because mm -hmm. um, they know, exist, right? right? They have one in Prince George's County. I actually know someone that said mm -hmm. they served on one, but does, how does the average person get the opportunity to serve on a civilian right. board? Right, so, so th what this bill mandates is that we, we take a, a hard look and there's going to be a report on how we can make structurally those changes statewide because right now it's it's different piecemeal. yeah piecemeal and different in every jurisdiction and there's you know going to be a real attempt to make some statewide uh, standards um, so that all communities have the same access and the same uh, mechanism to hold uh, law enforcement accountable you know when they do wrong Okay, that, and that's, that's good. And that passed um, this yes, session? Yes, that passed okay. this session. Um, okay. But I would say that, you know, I'm, I'm trying my best to keep the community informed so that they can provide additional oversight to how these bills are implemented. It's really important that uh, communities pay attention and not just say, oh, well, you know, okay, good, it passed. No, uh, implementation is key. So I want folks to... Uh, to continue to ask questions about these bills. Okay, and um, and also, you mentioned we talked briefly about the Freddie Gate great case, and that was something that people started to think that maybe police are able to easily get away with what. And this started um, even before Freddie Gray. When we look at the country, um, the Michael Brown case, among others, where there was like issues. What is your take on the on the Freddie Gray case? Because you know, there's at this point we're looking at police officers walking away without conviction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the things that have hap that happened in Baltimore and around the country, um, you know, many of us know that w w w technology has given us more access uh, than ever about um, incidents like these, but they're, they're unfortunately not necessarily new. Um, and, that, and while most law enforcement does a great job, and it's it's a hard job. And most of them, um, most of them, you know, cops and, and police out there are doing the right thing. Um, there are some that aren't, and 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 they need to be held accountable. Um, and we do we need to look at some changes. And and I think it's it's important for law enforcement to understand that um, that. This has to be a partnership. Um, if you're really going to make strides in reducing crime, reducing recidivism, it takes a partnership with the community. Um, when I was a prosecutor, we depended on civilian witnesses out there to, to tell us what happened, to tell the story in a trial. Uh, that's the only way that we can get a conviction only way we can get a conviction if we have a jury trial is to have a jury of citizens who you know believe in the system who trust uh, law enforcement uh, that they're by and large doing doing a good job um, so that that means that for those who aren't doing right we have to make sure that they're held accountable. We have to make sure that there are systemic changes um, such that these kind of, you know, rough rides, if they happen, you know, shooting individuals in the back, rolling up and just assuming that, you know, someone who looks different from you is doing wrong, that has to change. That has to change if there's going to be trust between the community and law enforcement. It has to change if communities are going to get safer. Now let me ask you an opinion on something because many people feel that there is too much of a relationship between a prosecutor 
and a police officer because let's just face mm -hmm. it, where do you get your cases from? Mm -hmm. The police report comes in, you work closely with the police, then you contact the right. civilian. And some people feel that um, when it comes to um, holding police accountable that the state's attorney should never be involved with any of it. How can you go after someone that you work so closely with? Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? It's a fair criticism. Um, I think most uh, state's attorney's offices, DA's offices, do the best they can to have that separation, um, but there has to be a close working relationship with the police department. You just there's no no real way to get around that. Um, but when there are instances, and we don't have to be talking about a high profile Freddie Gray kind of instance, it could be just your your run of the mill traffic stop, uh, your run of the mill drug case. We need to have uh, chief prosecutors and line prosecutors out there in the courtroom that say to the officer, look, you know, I understand you're doing your job. Here's how we did this wrong, and here's how we can do it better next time. Um, all of those kind of interactions can lead towards, um, one, the, the prosecutor having credibility, but two, establishing that there is a line there. There's a line between law, the, the police on the street and the prosecutor's office. And then two, the community can see that, you know what, this, this prosecutor is not just taking everything that the police officer brings to them. Um, and they're, there's, they're doing some education there. Um, so it's, it's a day-to-day -day work in progress that has to happen. Well, we're going to take a short break. This has been really helpful information, and we're going to come back and talk about some other very helpful information. So please stay with us. Thank you. FSHD is one of the most common forms of muscular dystrophy. It's a degenerative disease that weakens muscles in the face, shoulders, upper back, and legs. FSHD robs you of your smile and makes simple tasks nearly impossible to perform. FSHD affects hundreds of thousands of people, but most have never met another patient. Many have not even been diagnosed. Someone you know may be living with FSHD. Let them know they are not alone and that we're making real advances toward a treatment. You can help by going to our website, fshsociety.org slash curefshd and share the photos and facts about the disease using the hashtag CureFSHD. By simply raising awareness, you could change someone's life and help us get closer to a cure. You're going to need me. You're going to need us. All of us. You're going to need our help with your water. Your air. Your food. You're going to need our determination, our compassion. You're going to need the next generation of leaders to face the challenges the future will bring. And we promise we'll be there when you need us. Welcome back to Chat with the Lawyer, and I'm here chatting with Delegate Eric Barron about very important criminal justice issues in the 2016 legislative session, and also about his career. So we're in the next half. Let's talk about um, your career, um, but I want to start with something. As a criminal lawyer, you get to see the whole process, and one of the things that people say is that young men, if they knew the consequences of getting involved, in crime, they would they would think they would think twice. What do you have to say about that? What are your thoughts? Um, well, yeah, I would hope um, we're doing our best out there to discourage anyone um, from you know doing something illegal. Um, but um, you like, know, do you have a story of somebody you know? or people that you've represented that you've seen the consequences of getting involved in crime regardless of, ha of having a great lawyer like mm -hmm. yourself? Right. Well, um, you know, some, sometimes unfortunately there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of glamorizing about crime out there, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, the music and, you know, some of uh, 
you know, some of the, the cultural things out there um, that kind of glamorize uh, doing, doing wrong, frankly. Uh, but then when you do it and you're caught and then you're up uh, you know, for a bail hearing, um, things get real very quick. Um, and you can end up waiting in jail on some of the smallest, most you know, mundane type of crimes. Um, and when you're sitting in that jail uh, and you'd rather be home you know, watching TV or playing a, a video game, um, you know, I think uh, folks see that it's real then. And then um, you know, the system is such that if you don't, especially if you don't have great representation, um, you, can, you can do something expedient uh, that can end up following you and hurting you for the rest of your life. Give an example. Uh, so, you know, uh, pleading, taking a plea uh, to something, to a misdemeanor, something you may not think is a big deal, um, can end up on your record and then impact your ability to get employment. It can impact your ability to get in certain schools. Uh, it can hurt you from getting housing. Um, there are a number of uh, what they call collateral consequences to having a conviction, even, even a minor misdemeanor. Um, and it's something that um, you know, too many people don't think about uh, before you know, they do wrong. Um, but they'll think about it 5, 10, 15 years from now when it keeps coming up on their criminal background check and you know, they, it's impacting their ability to feed their family um, or to get a home. Now, we, we had previously on Chat with the Lawyer, we had a great program about reentry programs. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we talked about is how difficult it is for an ex-felon um, to get a job, to be able to get back on their feet. Do you, as a lawyer, you don't help, do you work with that or have you worked with those issues? I, I work with those issues in the legislature. I work with those issues as, uh, as an attorney and as a, a member of the bar. Um, in the legislature, uh, I've been working on a number of efforts to, one, to make sure on that Ju Justice Reinvestment Act there's going to be savings. Um, a portion of that savings will go towards uh, strong evidence-based re-entry programs. Um, the Justice Reinvestment Act also uh, makes uh, a categor categories of misdemeanors available for expungement as well. And I've been working on various changes to our expungement laws such that if you do end up with a record or, uh, or something that's not even a conviction that you can have the opportunity to have it cleared from your, your record such that when an employer does a background check, they're not making judgments, negative judgments against you for something you may not have even been convicted of. Or if you were, it was a, you know, appropriately very long ago and you've done everything you should do uh, up to that point and been a good person and uh, you should have an opportunity. You know, we, we, we want people who have done wrong to be rehabilitated and to get back on the right foot, then we also have to give them an opportunity, a second chance to succeed, right. you know. Um, so I've been very immersed in those issues and will continue to be in the next session. Now, now, when you responded, you mentioned bar associations, and that's something the average person doesn't know about. Bar association sounds like a little, you know, a club where, you know, everyone's drinking whiskey and talking. <laughs> now, bar associations provide a service to people, and you were president of one. Right. Um, so tell us about that. So uh, I, uh, last year, I was president of the J. Franklin Bourne Bar Association which is an organiz organization of primarily African-American lawyers in Prince George's and Montgomery County. Um, I had an opportunity to be the, the president of the organization last year. This year I'm the immediate past president. Um, one, one of the main things that the bar, bar associations in general and J. Franklin Bourne Bar Association in particular uh, 
do is public and community service projects. And um, what we frequently do, J. Franklin Bourne, is expungement clinics. And um, where we have once or twice a year, we organize attorneys to come and help people pro bono for free and make sure um, uh, that they're doing, filling out the expungement forms correctly. If they have a record and they have things that are eligible for expungement, we organize attorneys to help them clean their record. Mm -hmm. um, we do a number of different things like Christmas in April and fun, fun non-legal mm -hmm. community service projects, but in particular we do do a lot of pro bono works including expungement clinics and I had you know, the opportunity to lead that organization where we're um, you know, five, six hundred strong um, and uh, we're, we do a lot of good works in the community. Now, when you say expungement clinics, like somebody can come and explain the process. So this would be, you know, oftentimes we do it at a church. Churches tend to be a good venue. Um, we will have attorneys who are available during, uh, you know, a two or three hour window um, to help people who maybe you, you know you've been you know involved in the criminal justice system you're not maybe you have a conviction maybe you're not even sure what your record is right. you can come in we will have computers set up and an attorney that will help you pull your record mm -hmm. and then review which I if you have a record which items are available for expungement and then there are expungement form. The court system has expungement forms. The attorney will help help you fill out the form, help you file it, oh, wow. and then uh, you know from then on uh, there may be uh, a hearing on the expungement request, and the the attorney will appear and help you through that process as well. Interesting. Now I know that people say when you don't, when you can't find a lawyer, you should go to the Franklin Bar Association. Do you guys offer that type of service too? We, you can call the J. Franklin Bourne Bar Association. We will uh, refer you probably to the, the Prince George's County Bar Association it has a list of uh, uh, attorneys who are available to do pro bono work and we work hand in hand with that bar association. Um, as far as criminal cases, if you can't afford an attorney by law, by our constitution, you are entitled to an attorney in a criminal case. Um, so I would say anyone who uh, um, is not able to afford an attorney and you have a criminal matter, please go to the public defender's office. They have great attorneys and that's what they're there for, to help those who are unable to pay for a private attorney. And also another thing is that um, now, does Franklin Bourne actually come out into the community? Did, did they, as bar associations, do you all, if somebody wants them to come to the church, would, would they be interested in doing something? So we've, we've, we've been to the church and we go to the church, you know, uh, uh, every year in some manner, shape, or form. Um, one thing that we do annually um, is ask a lawyer, uh, sort of like your program here. Um, but we've... I think virtually every year we've gone to um, uh, Highland Park uh, Baptist Church, for example, and you know that would be an opportunity not just for expungements, but for any legal matter that you might have, any kind of question that uh, touches on the law. We we set up uh, a venue at the church where you can come in and ask a lawyer a question, any question. It could have to do with trust in the states. Uh, civil matter or business matter, um, anything. It's, it, and it is a great opportunity for the Bar Association to come out, meet the community, provide a service for, for, you know, for the community and, and to just continue to, to have that relationship. That's good, that's good. Now another issue that's been a really big issue in Prince George's County is domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Now have you worked on that in your career? I have. Um, yeah, I've handled domestic violence cases as a prosecutor here in the county um, years ago. Um, occasionally, uh, as, as a private attorney, I um, you know, assist in those kind of cases. Um, it is a serious problem, and 
We really need to do, um, we need to do more outreach on the issue in general. Um, and when cases do come to court, we really need to have an all hands on deck um, and make sure that folks who are doing wrong in the home never have that opportunity to do that again and that we use that, that point of contact with the justice system as an educational opportunity as well. Um, you know, one thing about domestic violence, unfortunately, it tends to be uh, a, a, a circular issue. You know, you have, you, people frequently don't think about the children in the home. And, uh, you know, at some point those children grow up and they're going to be a product of that experience. And many of the individuals that we see who are doing wrong in the home themselves were children in violent homes. So we gotta, we gotta stop that cycle. We have to stop that cycle. And the justice system, you know, it's unfortunate that it would get there, but when it happens, it should never happen again. And we need to use that as an educational opportunity for everyone within the home and empower victims and you know, educate um, the, the offender and the youth in the home. Now, I, you know, a lot of domestic violence advocates, and it's not advocates, more victims, and those that actually doing the groundwork, they're on the ground, they would say that the, there's not much in the system that actually protects some of domestic um, um, a victim of domestic violence until somebody gets hurt. Like someone dies or there's something, then there's like this big prosecution. And at this point, this person feels like they call the police, they don't get the support. What could you feel, what could be some of the things that you could, we could improve in the actual criminal justice system for domestic violence to protect those um, victims? Do you, do you have some thoughts? Well, when, when, someone, when someone files for a protective order, a right. peace order, um, they, have to feel that they're going into a system, they're going to a system to get help that is going to be meaningful. Um, and for whatever reason, we don't, the public doesn't have that confidence. So it's some, some and, and mostly we tend to be talking about women, you know, a lot of women don't have that confidence in the first place and so aren't seeking that help in the first instance and so we, as those involved in the justice system, need to make sure that people have confidence that if they go that route, that they are going to be protected. Um, there are plenty of mechanisms within the system to do that, but if one doesn't have confidence, you never, you never go there in the first place. And what do you mean um, by that? What's that? What do you mean by that? Like, if they don't so, have confidence, they might not file the, the protective order. Right, they might not file the protective order in the first place. And so what you have is someone who's remaining in a situation that is bad and is probably escalating. And then, the last you know, minute. then by the time they're doing that route, then, you know, we've, we, we've gone to a, a seriously bad place that maybe it didn't have, you know, have to go that far in the first place, um, women need to feel like, you know, they, they can do that in the first instance and they're not going to be punished and suffer for it at home because the system is going to take care of, they're gonna ensure that that person has no contact, stays away, that there will be consequences the first time someone messes up. Right. Um, and in, I think we all, you know, it got, kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier about a partnership between the law enforcement and the community. Exactly. As family members, as friends, you know, we need, we need to be more educated on those signs, you know, and the red flags. We need to listen to one another, you know, um, and be there for one another so that when someone is feeling vulnerable or may not be in a position to make that phone call, that we can see, see it and make it for them. Um, 
But now you do understand what I've heard is that people say that when sometimes when a woman does call when it hasn't escalated to that level, the police officer says, "Well, maybe it's not what you think." Um, so what what are your thoughts on that? Well, that's un that's just flat out un unacceptable. Mm -hmm. It's unacceptable, um, and you know I've heard I've heard things like that as well, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you know this. I feel like this can get caught up into kind of unrelated law enforcement, turf battles and such, but um, when you get that call, when the officer gets that call, um, they need to be themselves educated about domestic violence issues, about signs, about what procedures to go through in every case. Um, and if they're not, they need to be able to refer to a domestic violence, a family unit within the office that is trained to take care of these cases. I see. And that's within the prosecutor's office they have that? Well, they have, they do have a domestic violence unit within the, within the state's attorney's office, but they, they also need to have those units within the individual the law, enforcement. law enforcement offices in your Prince George County Police Department and your Sheriff's Department. And those offices need to talk to each other and co coordinate with each other. Um, you know, the unit in the police department needs to, if they're out in the street and there's a question, and they need to be able to call the domestic violence prosecutor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure that we always have that good cooperation and collaboration in all instances, which leads to you know, the things that you just talked about. Well, this has been a great interview, very important information. I'm sure you all agree. Um, and if somebody wants to get in talk, contact with you, how do they get in contact with you? Well, uh, you can call me anytime. My, my information, my uh, General Assembly information is public. Um, but I'll give you a number out there. Um, my law office, you can reach me at 301-804-3613. Again, it's 301-804-3613. I'm here to help, you know, in any way I can. Um, I have a strong commitment to the community and to public service. Uh, I truly believe it's what I am here for. So um, look forward to hearing from everyone. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all. And of course, if you want to hear more, you can go to www.chatwiththelawyer.tv. We have all of our episodes there, including information on other lawyers that they, you can be referred to. So please, thank you for watching us. I, I really didn't feel safe anymore at home. Sometimes I wouldn't eat. It was like this hunger pain in your stomach. It was just so lonely. I just felt like I was not important to anyone. I never thought homelessness could happen to someone like me. I remember coming here and I felt comfort, I felt safe. Graduating, graduating as a valedictorian, getting a job, keeping the job, it's just a good feeling. Because I've completely turned my life around and made it into what I've always wanted it to be. There's people out there who can help. There's people out there who care. And things can get better. If you call 1-800-RUNAWAY, you will get connected to the help you need.